the society now is flailing because we have left-leaning policies and we have right-leaning policies. We don't have right or wrong policies anymore. So if you're the SEC and you've got a kowtow to Elizabeth Warren, let's do stupid stuff at the SEC. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. How's uh, Skybridge doing? Well, we're, well, I mean, we're doing terrifically this year. Uh, we, you know, they wrote my obituary after the FTX debacle, but we're only up about 200% from then. So, you know, I, but I made a big, very big investment in Bitcoin. So that, that's the reason why we're really been powered up, you know. I feel like people have been writing your obituary for the past 17 years. I'm not really sure why, though. I mean, I have a lot of people that, I mean, I, I, I breed haters. Well, let, let's talk about that because why. I think some people do breed haters and others don't. Like right. some, like you don't have to be, let's say you're rich and famous. That people think, oh, that breeds haters. But no, I know a lot of rich and famous people who are, go about their business and nobody seems to like trash them that much. Right. You though, people love to hate you and they don't yeah. get their facts right ever. Like probably right. half the country still thinks you're working for Trump, for instance. Right. And no, yeah, well, nobody no, knows anything. If you're a left-leaning person, like ultra-left, you could have worked one minute for Trump, 11 days for Trump, one second for Trump. They hate you. You know, my, my son told a great... Are, are we live right now? I can keep going. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. My son told a great story the other day. He was in LA and he was in a restaurant and he was talking and, and somebody said, well, you're Anthony Scaramucci's son. And he said, yes, but I'm, but I'm also Anthony Scaramucci because he's junior. <laughs> and these two women looked at him with revulsion and they requested from the maitre d' to have their table moved because they were sitting next to him. Do you love that? I, I it, has, it has it has it has almost like an atomic bomb effect, but it's fine. I mean, I don't know whatever. People I, can do I, that. I, I totally believe that. Like and and of course it's a cliche now to say the country's gotten more polarized than ever. I mean, it's been polarized in the past like 1968, like mm -hmm. obviously the Civil War, but I do see people, I have seen the moving table phenomenon before. Even people who are like talking about two different political candidates, they can't sit in tables near each other. Crazy, right? It is. But, but let's, let's, why do you think people like to hate you? Like, do you, do you think it's like one particular thing that you did or, or is it like, you know what it is? You're, you're, you're a little bit, you're very New York in, a, in an yeah. ethnic Italian way. Maybe no. uh, people don't like that. I'm just yeah. guessing anything. I'm not a conform. I think I think I think when you talk about people that are rich and famous that are conformists, no problem. You know, Tom Hanks, no problem. He's way more famous than me. He's probably richer, but no no problem. But somebody like me, I don't actually give a shit. You allowed to curse on this podcast? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I actually You're don't give to, to curse. Yes, I don't I actually don't give a shit, James. And so um uh, I haven't conformed to any norms on Wall Street. I haven't conformed to any norms in politics. I'm not, you know, so you were, you know, like another thing has been said my, about my children, like, dad, you're killing my networking opportunities. You were, you were with Trump. So the Democrats hate your guts. You left Trump. So the Republicans hate your guts. You, you're really hurting my networking opportunities. Yeah. And I look at him like, well, look, maybe I'm getting closer to the truth. I, my, my, my point, James, I don't give a shit. I actually took what my grandmother said seriously when she insisted. And the quote was, what other people think of you is none of your business. I actually thought that that was the right approach. So I don't care. Have and, you always and, felt that way though? Like, I think you, I think there's been points probably where you really did care what people thought. At, as a kid, I didn't. And I think it's impossible to suggest that you don't care in general. Of course you care. When I got fired and I was getting destroyed in the media, it did bother me. I'm not going to bullshit you but it didn't cause me to change my way of being. I have not conformed myself to the style boxes that I'm supposed to sit in. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Also, I mean, you know, I mean, people forget I did go to these schools. I do have a degree. I am a well-read guy. Uh, if you're trying to two dimensionalize me as an ethnic Italian from Long Island, you may miss a few beats, you know? No, I, I think that's right. I think people, I think people easily stereotype. And by the way, just to mention in your in your latest book, From Wall Street to the White House and Back, there's a, even a reading list, and you quote many different authors, and 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 it's funny the story. Just 
this is not quite an author, it's more a movie, but you, when you tell a story of, of traveling with Trump on day five of the presidency and you're ex helping this expert explain the Palestinian Israel, Israel situation to him and you use Lawrence of Arabia to kind of get the point across that the expert was trying to get across. Well, the, the, the point I was trying to make is you got to read your audience. Trump does not want to be lectured to. So he's, he's probably the most insecure person I've ever met in my life. And so this requires him to always be right. It requires him never to be in a room where he thinks he doesn't know something. Like you can't sit there and tell him the difference between a Shia and a Sunni. That would really piss him off because he wants you to think that he knows what the difference is, you know? And so the, the relevant point in the story was the national security expert was trying to tell him about the Sykes-Picos Treaty, which was the treaty that uh, the British and the French negotiated with the Ottoman Empire upon the departure from the Middle East as they were pulling out of there after the Second World War. And it was a very racist treaty, I might add. And they created these imaginary countries like Syria and Iraq. And they divided them in a way so that there would always be a border dispute in the region. And so uh, the expert was trying to explain to Trump what David Frumkin wrote in his book, The Peace to End All Peace. And he was lecturing Trump and he was being somewhat pedantic. Trump obviously didn't know what the F he was talking about. And he shut him down and he got like very rude with him. And so I waited about an hour. It was a long flight to L.A. We were doing a fundraiser. I waited about an hour. And then I said to Trump casually, oh, do you remember the movie Lawrence of Arabia? I said, oh, with Peter O'Toole. I said, yeah. I said, do you remember, you remember what the movie was about? Eh, not really, but I, I loved the movie. It was great. And then I explained to him what the movie was about, which was ultimately the clash of the different tribes as a result of them arguing over the border disputes. And it was a way to get into Trump's brain what was going on. I also, uh, you know, when the trade issues came up, he was always questioning, well, why did the U.S. do this or why did the U.S. do that? And I had to explain to him, listen, we set the trade to be uneven in the beginning. We had two and a half percent of the world's population, 65 percent of the world's output, the United States was trying to create rising living standards around the world uh, to foment peace and prosperity. You know, now maybe we needed to make an adjustment on that. And I think to be fair to Trump on that one issue, uh, the Chinese did take advantage of that trade policy that we put in place. But um, you, you can't get to him without telling him a story. He's not the type of person that is intellectually secure where you could actually tell him something that he doesn't know, and he'll ask you questions about it in a way that would indicate that he had intellectual security. Now, you know, I'll, uh, and, and look, you write about this in, in your book, and I'll do an intro later describing the book more fully, but mm -hmm. you've been on a, a fascinating journey basically since, I mean, your whole life, but since 2016, I mean, you were essentially the communications director for like five minutes, 11 days specifically. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, you've been running your, your hedge fund, but also, you know, the whole FTX thing where on the downside, you were, you know, buddies with Sam Bankman, you know, Freed, whatever his name, Friedman and, and Sam and Bankman Freed. Yep. Freed. And, and you're a, a huge supporter of, of Bitcoin. So you've been, so the downside was FTX. The upside is you've really called it on Bitcoin. And so I'm going to, I want to ask you about that, but just the 11 days in the White House, why did he fire you after 11 days? Like, what happened? Well, you know- and, Or John or, Kelly, like the whole thing. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, if, you got, if you got General Kelly on, he would tell you, I, got, I didn't get fired because of what I said about Steve Bannon, which was probably one of the funniest things that's ever been said from the White House, actually. Um, in fact, Trump liked that. You know, Trump has a potty mouth. He thought it was funny. I got fired because I was fighting with Trump. I got fired because there were a couple of issues that came up and he called me a deep stater. And hmm. he said, oh, I thought you were working for me, but you're really a deep stater. I was like, well, first of all, this deep state nonsense is a bunch of nonsense. And then secondarily, I'm obviously not a deep stater. I'm a kid from Long Island that never worked in the government, but I did swear an oath to the constitution. And I, did, I do respect the institution of the office 
that you're there to serve the American people. I wasn't necessarily there to serve Trump. He may have been my boss, but if there was something he wanted to do, like divulge national security secrets or let let loose confidential information that the country has held for purposes of keeping our agents safe around the world, I was not going to be for that. And so even if he was for that, and so there was a couple of things like that happened. Next thing you know, I was fired. And uh, that's fine. I mean, I'm a big boy. I never blamed my firing on anybody other than myself. If you read the book or you've listened to any of my interviews, why'd you get fired? Well, I did things that the president didn't like. He fired me. It was my fault to be fired. I hold myself accountable. But, uh, you know, I never let it define me. I think that's an important part of the story. You know, uh, uh, you talk about people writing your obituary. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, he's disgraced himself by working for Trump and then he got fired by Trump. So he's done. You know, you're, you know, it's over when you say it's over, James. You know that. I've read your stuff. I, I follow you. I listen to your podcast. It's over when you say it's over. It's not over when somebody else says it's over. And I think that's an important thing. You, you were also very kind. You probably don't even remember this, but 14 years ago, my first book I wrote about uh, was called Goodbye, Gordon Gecko. You wrote oh, a very oh, nice book. Oh. Of course, I remember. Yeah, we had. I wrote it in the Financial Times. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed the book. You wrote a very nice on it. You know, a very nice review. And but that was an honest story about growing up clueless and not knowing how to dress, not knowing how to. You know, my first time inside of a commercial office building was my callback interview to Goldman Sachs. Huh. I had never been inside of a country club's locker room. I don't know how to play golf. I don't know how to hit a a tennis ball. My dad was a laborer. You know, he grew he grew into a crane operator, but I didn't have any of the, you know, customary secret handshakes or whatever the BS is. I didn't know anything about any any of this stuff, you know? And uh and so I've been an I'm not even an outer borough person, right? You know, like Trump is an insecure guy. He's an outer borough person. I'm not even from the outer boroughs. I'm from Nassau County. I mean that's even like it's another quantum electron orbit right. away from the action. You follow what I'm saying? So I'm yeah. quintessentially an outsider. The difference between a guy like me or Donald Trump is I don't mind being an outsider. You know, Trump couldn't get into Deepdale, which is a very famous country club out here. So he built 18 golf courses. You know, I, I got to show you guys. I didn't get into Deepdale. I mean, they probably wanted me to landscape the fucking place. You know, I didn't get into Deepdale. I laughed. I said, okay, no big deal. I'll go to another golf course. You, 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 you follow what I'm saying? You, you either know who you are and you're comfortable in your own skin or you drive yourself crazy. You got, you got to make that decision, you know? I think, I think it's hard. I think, I think the, the average, the, the, what most people do, and I would say probably what I do, is I do care what people think and I try very hard not to care what people think. So like, you, you, I, I don't know if we were alive. You mentioned, uh, quote unquote, my friend Jerry Seinfeld just turned 70. I cared what people thought after his article came out. And I was upset. A lot of people were so angry at me. And it took, it took a while to kind of build resilience. And I've had other situations similar in the past where I have to individually build resilience for each situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times I probably care too much. I mean, this is the reason why I admire you. I think that that piece uh, that you wrote about New York was a seminal piece. Whether you agreed with that piece or you didn't agree with the piece, it was basically a wake-up call to your fellow New Yorkers about what is happening and what could happen if we don't get our stuff together. You know, and, and by the way, this I'm talking to you on a great day for New York because uh, the fact that the NYPD went in and cleaned up the acts of insanity and stupidity sure. that were going on at Columbia University, I think is a great sign that perhaps maybe the pendulum is going to swing back into the middle. New Yorkers don't like buying their cosmetics or their toothpaste and toothbrushes behind plastic with, uh, they don't like it. Okay. There are 6,000 known criminals that are in professional criminal rings that are stealing from these stores. It's not racist to lock that person up to improve the quality of life of seven and a half million people. It's just not racist. It's not a black or white issue. 
it's a right or wrong issue. And I think what's happening now is people are like, okay, stop and frisk was racist. So we're going to make things quote unquote non-racist. But they destroyed the quality of life inside the city. And so I'm hoping that a lot of these things that are happening now move the city back to neutral. And you were a part of that. And I think you deserve credit for that. And I, and I, and I admire it. I don't, I don't, and I, and I also got, got Jerry's point. I read Jerry's rebuttal to what you're saying, but Jerry's missing some things in his argument as well, which is, hey, man, do not make the mistake of not acknowledging the problems. Here are the problems. Right. We have solutions that can fix these problems. If we don't fix these problems, James is going to be, be right. You know, you've got a half a million people that have left, mostly the rich, because they have the wherewithal and the mobility to leave. And uh, you're going to leave us in a worse state if we don't fix these problems. You fix I mean, these problems, this is the greatest city in the world. Everybody will come back and everyone will be here. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I'm, look, we're, we're from New York and I love New York. I didn't want I didn't want it to have problems, but I thought, like you said, I thought people were ignoring what was happening. When you have and everybody was saying afterwards, oh, let kind of the rich move to Florida. They forget that New York City needs a hundred billions a hundred billion dollars a year to open the doors. That they get that money from the the hedge fund managers who pay for expensive commercial real estate and pay expensive taxes. Mm-hmm. That, that's where they get their money. You can't just raise taxes on everybody else. There's not enough money there. Right. So, exactly. You, you know, okay. now I, yeah, and I'm not just saying that because I'm on your podcast. I'm a huge fan of yours. I think you have you're very good at understanding human emotion, assessing human intelligence, and also there are things you talk about systematically that if you deploy those things, they make you more confident and they make you more happy. And if you yeah. don't deploy those things, they make you more miserable because. Your design, Woody Allen ultimately is right. You're designed for misery. Okay. Why are you designed for misery? You have a, you have a hundred thousand year old piece of machinery that you're living inside of. It hasn't had a software upgrade in a hundred thousand years and it's designed to be protective. It's designed to make you worry. It's designed to make you run from the woolly mammoth. It's designed to make you be envious. Of course you're envious. You see someone else has a bigger cave than you. They got a better looking cave woman. You go over there, hit them with a rock. You take the cave woman, you take the cave. That's how we're designed. But in a modern society, we don't have to be like that. And we can do things that are more transformative and we can do things that are more sentient if we're able to observe ourselves. You're very good at that. And I've learned a lot from you. Well, I I appreciate you saying that. I mean, look, Again, I've been following your story as well these past few years, and it's it's been amazing the ups and downs. Like, let, let's talk about Bitcoin for a second because everybody takes single situations, like let's say FTX, a, a company that see everybody in the world thought it was like one of the best companies in 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 the world, and then suddenly afterwards, everyone said, "Oh, I knew that was a fraud." But you know, l- literally, it's this company in the Bahamas that everyone signif- when it when it collapsed, everyone thought, "Oh." Bitcoin's dead. It's just a company in the Bahamas that had a fraud, but had nothing to do with the story of Bitcoin. So what's your, how'd you get into Bitcoin? And then, and then you know, you did, everybody wrote your obituary when FTX failed and you were involved in it. Like, how'd you survive that? Well, I mean, let's step back for a second because uh, uh, there's a lot there. So let me just step back for one second and just say this. Uh, you're right. When it happens, everybody says that they knew, you know, when Bernie Madoff blew up in 2008, I can't tell you, James, the number of people that said to me, well, I knew he was a fraud. I'm like, I didn't know he was a fraud. I didn't have any money with him. Let let, let, let me just, sorry to interrupt, but like I met Bernie Madoff a few months before the collapse. He actually, I was running my own fund of funds and he offered me a job and, but I was already running a fund of funds and he wouldn't invest because he was just nervous about quote unquote investing money outside the firm. So he just didn't have any money there. But uh, as I was leaving the lipstick building, which is the building he was in, every hedge fund manager I knew called me and said, can, can you put in a word for us? We want to invest in Madoff, but he doesn't let anybody invest. 
And afterwards, 100% of those people told me, no, there's no way I could have called you. I knew Madoff was a fraud the whole time. And I'm like, no, I have it on my phone right here. You called me that well, moment. Well, that, 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 you know, I had people that said to me, I knew Sam was a fraud. And I looked at the person. I said, didn't you have an account at FTX? Um, uh, yeah, I, I did. I said, is your account frozen? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, well, how did you know then it was a fraud? If you had an account at FTX, why would you have an account with somebody that's a fraud? So in other words, let's stop lying to each other and tell the truth about things. I think that's where, you know, and I, and I write this in the book and I tell this to my children. If you have integrity, James, you will always have opportunity. Also, if you're nice to people, you can get fired from the White House. You can make a mistake and allow Sam Bankman Free to invest in your business, and you will still survive that. You will have friends that come to your aid. If that's you a, that's an important insight that people should pay attention to, but, but because it's the it's the cliche, be nice to the people on the way up because they're the same people you meet on the way down, right? Think about like somebody like Elliot Spitzer as an example. He was mean and cruel and arrogant towards people. When he blew up, he blew out. OK, yeah. you can have mistakes in your life and you can do things that are misguided, but you can also benefit from your goodwill that you've created. You see what I mean? Yeah, this is very important. But on Sam, I don't revise history there. I liked him. Uh, he was a nice guy. Asked Mike Novogratz. Um, he called me uh, unsolicited uh, through a third party. Uh, the third party called me and said, hey, there's a guy by the name of Sam Bankman Fried. He'd like to talk to you. I said, okay, no problem. He said, yeah, it's got to be 9 p.m. on blah, blah day. I said, why 9 p.m.? Well, he's in Hong Kong. I said, okay, no problem. He had just signed a deal to name the arena in Miami after the company. So I said, okay, this is an up and coming cryptocurrency exchange. I had already been long Bitcoin and an investor. We'll get to the Bitcoin story in a second. but when I got on the phone with Sam, he was this uh, staccato talking, somewhat awkward young man that seemed absolutely brilliant. He explained to me what he was doing. He wanted to sponsor the SALT conference. He wanted to come to New York and he wanted to meet people in that sort of crossover between traditional finance and DeFi. I said, okay, I'll, I'll you know, I accepted his money. And by the way, he paid me very quickly. And you're a student of Wall Street, you know, fast pay makes fast friends. And so I said, okay, this guy seems like he's legit. He came to the conference. He had a great time. He then asked me if he could uh, sponsor more conferences. We struck up a deal with him. And then he invited me, and this was a seminal moment for me, uh, and it may not reflect well on me or whatever. I'll just tell you the truth. He invited me to a charity outing at the FTX Arena. That his 84 year old aunt was coordinating. She was incredibly nice. And they, they had given $10 million of scholarship money to some of the poor public high schools in the Miami area. And we were going to do a mock shark tank for hmm. these students. And we had Senator Cory Booker there, Maxine Waters, Waters, I guess her name is. We had uh, uh, Kevin O'Leary and I. We're going to do the mock mock judging for them. Uh, the parents were there. Sam was there. I thought this was like a great Jewish family where the kid had grown up in suburbia, but on the campus of Stanford University. So I bought hook, line, and sinker into Sam Bankman Free. Now, if you want to uh, think worse of me for that, there's nothing I can do about it because it happened. But I did learn something from it, James, and that is a crime like the Madoff crime or the Sam Bankman Freed crime, it gets, it gets created by a small group of people. See, that crime can't happen at Skybridge because I've got 50 different checks and balances going on. I've got an outside administrator, an outside account, all blue chip, Pershing as the uh, custodian of the assets. Uh, three people in control, one in compliance, one on the legal team. So when you have 50 or 60 people looking at something, there'll always be a person of conscience that 
raises their hand and says, hey, I'm sorry, this doesn't work for me. A, a financial crime gets caused or created by a closed net of people. And he had four people working on this with him uh, and they all pled guilty, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I missed it. He, they, they did such a brilliant job of covering over what they did in terms of what they showed you from a due diligence perspective and what they were actually doing. And if you followed the case, it wasn't just me. It was 25 of the largest venture capitalists in the world, sovereign wealth funds, leading investors. I it's don't sort like of amazing Ma because like, like take Madoff as, as an example. He really didn't have institutional investors because he knew he wouldn't be able to get past due diligence. But you and, and these other VCs and so on, you're a professional due diligence person. Like Skybridge is a fund of funds. You invest in other people and other funds. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Like, so what I'm saying is I'm giving credit to him for, for, for fooling no, he, so he, many people this way. Like, how do you think, he, so, what was, how do you think he did that? So they created a software and it was pointed out during the case. So, so one of the things about crypto, James, it's perpetual meaning that the market's open 24 seven. So when I get a statement from my brokerage people at the end of a month, like we just ended the month yesterday, uh, whatever the prices were at four o'clock, they mail me a statement or they send me one electronically and they show me what I, uh, what I own. And it's priced as of the end of the day, 4 p.m. What Sam and the crypto world does is when you get that statement, it's priced at midnight on the last day of the month. But what Sam was doing is there were 10 seconds where your money looked like it was in your account. They printed you the statement. And then for the other 365, you know, sorry, the other 24 hours, if you will, or 23 hours and 59 minutes, it was in his account. So at midnight, they they made it look like it was back in your account. So if you logged on to your app, you saw your money in your account, but it wasn't in your account. He also did something called paper Bitcoin. Uh, and not to bore your, your, your listeners, but what is paper Bitcoin? So let's say James wants to buy Bitcoin. He calls me. I'm the broker. Uh, I'm now making a book on Bitcoin, meaning I don't buy Bitcoin for you, James. I electronically pretend that it's in your account. But I now took the money that you gave me, $2 billion worth of it, I might add, I, and I put it in my own account. And so now I am short the price movement of Bitcoin. You think you own Bitcoin. No Bitcoin has ever been bought. Hmm. That's paper Bitcoin. He did $2 billion worth of paper Bitcoin. Can you imagine that? So, so basically then as prices dropped in 2022, 2021, uh, he, he, he basically couldn't return the money because he had none. Could, couldn't return the money and, and, and he, couldn't, he couldn't catch up. He couldn't catch up. And so uh, he ha also had a uh, adversary in uh, this man, Chen Pao Zhao, CZ, who was the CEO of Binance, who... Uh, shoved it on him. You know, he owned a lot of his FTT tokens and he put those tokens up for sale and shoved that on Sam at the low point in the market. And so there was a combination of things that happened. But listen, you know, very bad story. What are the learning lessons? I just explained one of them. That's how a financial crime gets committed. Learning lesson number two, very important lesson. Something goes wrong. Tell the truth. Okay, I went right on the air. Just imagine the hero to goat move. September 7th, I sold a piece of my company to Sam. I was riding high thinking I was going to be working with the Mark Zuckerberg of crypto. By November the 8th, I was back on television. I had gone from hero to zero, and I was not working with the Mark Zuckerberg of crypto, but I was working with the Bernie Madoff of crypto. And I had to explain that on national television. And then how it, much were you involved? I faced in the music, James. I faced the music. I went, in, I went and made, you know, made the interview. Yeah. I mean, and you were, you were kind of brutal about it all the way down. Like how much were you involved in 
kind of the, the court case and, you know, sort of the unraveling of what happened. Um, you know, I had a, I had a, I was a, I was a, uh, not a witness. I was called by the Department of Justice to testify behind closed doors uh, for four and a half hours on what I learned. I also turned over my phones. So my WhatsApp, my signal, my text messages, my email traffic, I gave all of that to the Department of Justice. And I sat with them for four and a half hours and explained to them everything that I saw. And by the way, it wasn't just the Department of Justice. The IRS was there. The SEC was there. I mean, you want to talk about a non-fun time in life? Sitting by yourself with a lawyer under oath with the SEC, the IRS, the FBI. It's like a dream come true. And the Department of Justice, okay? And that's what Sam put me and my family through. But as I said to those guys, here's what happened, and here's here's the whole story. And and uh, you know what's interesting is they offered me something called a proffer, and I don't know if you know what that is, but no. a proffer is so they called me in as a voluntary witness, and so if they ever decided to quote unquote prosecute me, a proffer means they could exclude the testimony that I was giving them. And I looked at them and said, I don't need a proffer. If you want to, if you want to come after me for whatever happened, go ahead. I didn't do anything wrong. I did. I make a mistake in judgment. Yes, I did. But I told my attorney, we're not negotiating a proffer with the Department of Justice. I don't need a proffer. Do you think that's gonna, something they offer to see if you're willing to, to take it? Maybe I don't know. That's a good point. I, I didn't think of that. Maybe, maybe. But my attitude was, I have nothing to hide. Here is everything. Here's what happened. I've been on Wall Street for 36 years. I don't even have a personal trading account. I've never done a personal trade. So yeah. I'm not going to, I, I, all my money's in my fund. Here's everything that I have. I've been a registered investment advisor. I'm a, uh, a broker dealer. I have a broker dealer license, a series 24, seven and 63. Uh, good luck to you. I've never had a violation. I'm not going to spoil that at age 60. You know, I mean, come on. This is what happened. I made a mistake in judgment. And, uh, and, and what, I, what happened? I invest in my fund. I, I, I mean, in my firm, I'm sorry. What happened to his investment in Skybridge? Like what, how did that play out? Well, I mean, the, the, you know, the bankruptcy estate still owns the investment. And I would imagine at some point when they get around to it, they'll contact us and we'll negotiate with them. We're the, we're the only buyer for that asset because, uh, the, you know, Sam was trying to buy the whole business, James. Hmm. So, so the, it was set up as a minority stake with a three-year option to buy the rest of the business. And so there's no minority rights there. There's no protective economic rights or preferences. It's really not valuable to anybody. I can run the business till the day I die exactly the way I'm running it without any interference from the bankruptcy estate or from Sam or whoever the legacy is of Sam. And so we'll just let, we'll let it, we'll let it run its course. And at the end of the day, we'll we'll buy it back. But I, as I pointed out to people, he hurt us and he damaged us. He hurt the business. So we're not interested in buying it back at a premium. I can assure you of that. And like, and so how did you um how did you first get? And I feel like everybody got has a Bitcoin origin story. Like there's somebody yes. who was knowledgeable who told you about Bitcoin, and a, a light went off in your head, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, I think I have to start with the misses. Okay. So 2012, I was introduced to Bitcoin. I was like, this is a bunch of malarkey. I put out a tweet that said, I don't understand Bitcoin and who cares and caveat emptor. I think that's on the internet somewhere. And then 2014, the Winklevoss brothers, uh, the twins came to my conference. They explained Bitcoin to me and they were very passionate about Bitcoin. And I was like, all right, you guys are very smart guys. This will probably work, but I'm an institutional investor. I can't get anywhere near it. That was 2014. And then something seminal did happen. In 2017, I was in the White House. And this happened on a Wednesday, James. The reason I know that I was only there for one Wednesday. So I do know that it <laughs> happened on a Wednesday. And two guys from the Federal Reserve came in to talk about the white paper that they had you know, written about the digitization of the U.S. dollar. 
And I asked the question in the meeting, I said, is this like the blockchain? Is Oh yes, this would be over the blockchain. And then I said, so like Bitcoin? And they said, yes, well, you know, slightly different. It, we have our own blockchain, but it would be technically similar to Bitcoin. And then the light bulb went off in my head. I said, okay, I am really missing this. I can't be that stunad, which is like stupid in Italian slang. I got I to gotta get up to speed on Bitcoin. And so I got fired a couple of days later. I went and bought the URL skybridgebitcoin.com. And then I did what I always recommend to people, do your homework. I don't know anybody that's done homework on Bitcoin, James, uh, that's gone down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and comes up with, I'm not buying any Bitcoin. I haven't found anybody yet. Uh, I, I usually find that the Bitcoin critics are like I was back in 2012. They don't understand it. And, a, and it's very superficial. And so anyway, make a long story short, I built a list of things that I would need to have happen for me to invest in Bitcoin. Those things started happening. And in like, like what was on that list? So the three main things was number one, we had to get to 100 million wallets. Uh, at the time of my first investment, it was at 80 million and going up. Number two, I had to get comfortable with the regulation. Uh, and this is back in 2020. You say, well, how did I get comfortable? Well, the IRS deemed Bitcoin intangible property. And the minute they did that, I knew that Bitcoin was going to be okay in the United States because property rights in this country are sacrosanct. Uh, they date back to the Magna Carta. Uh, it's, 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 it's traced through British common law, our property rights. And this is still a capitalist society. And we protect people's property rights contractually. And when the IRS said it was intangible property, good luck to the likes of Gary Gensler and the Tsarina, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, they may not like me owning Bitcoin, but it's too bad. The IRS already deemed it property. And therefore, the court system is going to protect my property. And then the third thing, which I think was very important, is if I'm going to buy nine figures worth of Bitcoin, which I need to if it's going to have a meaningful impact on my clients, I have to have a place where I can store it. And there were really good service and storage options, including Fidelity Digital Assets, Coinbase Prime, or even uh, uh, New York Digital Investment Group. Those are three great places to store your Bitcoin. Uh, I do have some of Galaxy, by the way, as well. So, so, so for me, uh, that was the decision. And and what do you think is the next? I mean, we've had kind of these some some important catalysts, some not as important. I don't think the having is that important, but but the Bitcoin ETFs is very important catalyst because now finally both Main Street and the institutions can feel comfortable buying Bitcoin. What, what ultimate effect do you think this is going to have on, on Bitcoin? Well, you know, I mean, here, here's the thing. We're in an instant gratification world and everybody wants to be boom, instantly gratified and Bitcoin should shoot the 300,000 tonight and everyone should get rich immediately and so on and so forth. It doesn't work like that in the real world. So there are buyers and sellers and there are speculators and skeptics alongside of long-term investors. And so what ends up happening in a situation like this, most people don't understand the asset. And there's a lot of people out there that are trading that asset as opposed to really understanding it. And so there's a huge volatility in an asset like Bitcoin because it's so early. And by the way, I, you can compare it to early assets like Amazon or Apple Computer back in the day. Until the businesses get matured and scale, they can oscillate and trade with a lot of volatility. And so the problem right now is Bitcoin is an 80 vol asset. So it went up, it started the year, I guess, at 40 something. It went to 73,000. I think it's trading at like 58 or 59,000 right now, somewhere in there, 57,000. And it's moving around a lot. Could it go back to 30,000? I think it's possible. I don't, I don't see it ever going to zero at this point. But what is happening while people are, short terming and trying to time Bitcoin is the network itself is growing and it's growing exponentially. And so as that network grows, uh, the network effect, Medcalf's law, uh, will make that asset, uh, that piece of digital property way more valuable over time. And so, um, you know, I bought my bit first Bitcoin at 17,000 in 2020. It shot to 69,000. I was a genius. It then went from 69,000 to 17,000. I was a doofus. 
It's now gone from 17,000 to 73,000, now at 57,000. I guess I'm a dummy now because it went from 73 to 57. Yeah, why didn't you sell at the top? Yeah, exactly. So I'm, you know, you know, depending on the time frame, I'm either a dummy or a genius. And the truth of the matter is we're never as smart or as dumb as we look. But if I am right about this asset, it will trade to a market capitalization similar to gold. If I am right I, about the asset. I mean, you look at you look at gold is very interesting because the first gold ETF is introduced, I think, in 2004. And then it had seven straight up years from there because now suddenly people could buy it. And, you know, now you have sovereign wealth funds, funds like Skybridge, funds like, you know, other hedge funds, mutual funds can finally buy it. This seems like a huge thing. Plus, you see more countries like, you know, Switzerland has a, a, a referendum on the ballot now to include Bitcoin in their reserves. And, you know, this is just talking about Bitcoin, not even other mm -hmm. crypto assets and uses. So one thing I always tell people is that it's not going to be this price. Yeah. It's either going to be zero or yeah. millions. Like it's yeah. not going to kind of, it's on, it's on its way to where it's going to be. I, I agree with that. I just, I, I, and again, I could be wrong. Let me tell you something. As evidenced by my book, I've been humbled by life. I've been humbled by markets. So uh, what I'm about to say may or may not be right. I honestly have to, uh, you know, hold myself humbly in that position. But I think it's going to be hard for it to be zero only because of the expansion of the network effect and that the asset is being supported by very large institutions that have ETFs. And you know this as well as anybody, Wall Street is a selling machine. And so if Wall Street has a product known as a Bitcoin ETF, they are out there selling that product to a very large group of individuals and institutional investors. So it may go to zero. I would say that's a very low probability. Uh, you know, could it get to a million dollars? You'd have to see Bitcoin be recognized as a digital piece of property akin to gold, and then it could. The one, the one, one of the valuable use cases which I've seen is actually in the human rights community. So you, can, how are you going to fund like a, a activists supporting the Uyghurs in China? Mm -hmm. through currency like how are you going to send the money you have to do it through crypto it's the only mm -hmm. way yeah. i've been to conferences where activists are there and they're being trained on how to use crypto to raise crypto for you know the the revolutions in their countries and they, including you know a hundred million or has been sent to ukraine through crypto so it's the u.s is, is one of the biggest customers of crypto yes and i and i and i would point out that there's a very large professionalized gambling that's taking place in Europe on these soccer teams. There's no way that could happen without the crypto markets moving this stuff relatively costless among the participants. So uh, those are minor things that are happening. One major thing would be if you develop the wallet where we could have a wallet to wallet connectivity with each other and you and I could go into a department store or a restaurant and we could, uh, cross money to the restaurateur or cross money to the department store without paying the American express fee. And I think that we're three to five years away from that. You think even that long? Well, well, I'm, I'm being, I'm being conservative. I mean, it, it could happen more quickly. Um, you know, the, the, you know, look, the, the U S regulator, again, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly does not like the asset class. And so yeah. it's taking longer for its full adoption as a result of that. And that's really Elizabeth Warren was given a lot of latitude over financial services from Joe Biden as part of an agreement with her when she left the 2020 campaign and endorsed him. You know, I think it's going to be very interesting also when people start, quote unquote, tokenizing real assets. So let's say let's say a, a college student graduates with $100,000 in student loans. Imagine if they, quote unquote, IPO 10% of their future income streams by tokenizing it, make, making, you know, income coin or whatever that they kind of sell mm -hmm. off. And now people who buy that coin, James coin, can, can um, you know, basically benefit as a, a former student's income growth changes over time. It gets 10% of all the income flows. They can pay down their student loans. They have an opportunity to, um, 
you know, create additional wealth for themselves and not rely on the government system to to pay their loans or pay their loans back or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I think tokenizing yeah. is going to be very interesting. Well, I mean, if you if you follow, um, you know, listen, great story, right? Uh, Larry Fink is negative on Bitcoin, tells people he's negative on it. And then lo and behold, uh, he's orange pilled by a group of Bitcoiners. And he now has the most successful ETF in US history. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he would tell you that what you just said is 100% true. We're going to tokenize everything. You know yeah. I, mean? I, th I think that's what's going to happen. So, so politically now, I feel like here we are again, Biden, Trump, you obviously yeah. have been, you've been involved as far as I know in, in every election since 2008 or 2012. I remember talking with you about Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I didn't know you in 2008 for Obama, but I know you donated to his campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned in the book. And, uh, and then of course, 2016, 2020, what's, what's happening now? It's going to be Trump versus so Biden again. So I, I, and again, this is probably why people hate me. I mean, I, I'm not glued necessarily to one party. I'm glued to what I think makes sense. You know, Barack Obama and I went to law school together. I didn't know him super well in law school. My friends knew him. Um, I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give him some money, you know, for his campaign. This is, you know, 2007. So how many years ago is that? 18, I guess, or, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. 17, 17 years ago. Yeah. Yes. And I, I just looked around and said, okay, I'm never going to know anybody that's actually the president. I mean, that's what I was thinking at the time, you know, and I said, okay, so I'm Barack Obama, somebody I know, I'm going to give him some money. He won. I wasn't in love with his policies. I'm a lifelong Republican. And so I went back to my Republican, you know, stripes and supported, uh, Mitt Romney, but I've been involved. This is the irony of everything. You know, I've been involved in politics since 1993. How did I get involved in politics? I had no money, James. And I was working as a high net worth broker, financial advisor at uh, Goldman. And I wasn't a member of a country club. I didn't know the, the, the hand signals that you needed to do in the world of the wealthy. And so I said, well, how am I going to meet these people? And the way to meet these people was... Uh, uh, politics. I could go to these political fundraisers. I would meet the people and potentially I could do business with them. So I wrote the first check. This is the great irony of life. I wrote the first check, $250, young Republicans for Rudy Giuliani. He had, <laughs> he had lost in 1989. He was now running again in 1993. And I was young Republicans for Rudy. Do you love that? That's funny. Okay. Okay, and uh, and now I'm going to these fundraisers with him. Uh, he wins, which is like the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me at age 30, right? I'm I've now got the parking placard, and I I can park my car on two wheels anywhere in in the city, and I'm working for the mayor. And uh, lo and behold, I'm starting to meet clients. And then Rudy introduced me to Pataki, so I'm now young Republicans for Pataki. And then you may or may not remember this. Rudy switches. He 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 endorses Chris and Andrew's father, Mario Cuomo, in '94. You know and, what? And I did not remember that. Yeah, I'm yeah. So yeah, I didn't no, remember that. I remember it because me and George Pataki are like, "What the hell is he doing?" He was always mashugan. He was always a little nuts, you know. And uh, so he went with uh, he didn't. Him and Pataki didn't talk for like a year after that. I mean, it was a very hard time to yeah. thaw that out. Okay. Uh, Alphonse D'Amato had to get involved with that, the whole thing. But anyway, so now I've worked for the mayor and the governor. And so that's not big enough for me because I'm a little stew not. I got to go work on a presidential campaign. So I work for George W. Bush. Hmm. You know, so I've been around the hoop of politics for, you know, 30 years. And uh, my mistake among many, and I, you know, if I was going to write a book of mistakes it would be longer than War and Peace, and you wouldn't have enough time in your life to read all the mistakes that I've made. But if I, I want to talk about a mistake is I got full of myself, James. Okay, I let my ego get to me. So when Trump offered me the job, 
even though my wife hates Trump almost as much as Melania hates him, and that's like the highest standard of hatred, <laughs> I took the job. Uh, and I was trying to put a round peg in a square hole to fit my ego, James. Okay, yeah, I wanted my narrative. Oh, blue collar kid, Tufts and Harvard, Goldman, two successful businesses. I'm now going to go work in the White House for the American president. Well, the American president's batshit crazy. No, that's okay, because it's not that that doesn't fit my narrative. It doesn't fit and soothe my ego. You see what I mean? And so the book is about that cautionary tale. Don't put your ego and don't put your pride into your decision making. When you do that, it can really blow you up. It can really hurt you badly. And well, that's what happened. But I, I want to defend you against yourself a little bit here. Like you, you don't believe in taxing unrealized gains, for instance, on investments. Okay. Biden is potentially proposing that yeah. to Congress, which is the most insane kind of law. It would crash yeah. the entire economy. So you yes. don't believe in, in, BS like that, you do believe in, you know, a lot of the economics of the Re Republican Party and you believed in Trump. OK, you hadn't wor yet worked cl that closely with him. You took a job supporting your, your beliefs and principles. And like you said, you're working for the American people. You're not yeah. going to work for someone who's going to try to do a 44 percent capital gains tax and 25 percent taxing unrealized gains. Are they, do they just like make this stuff up because they think it'll get voters? Like nobody actually believes in that policy, do they? Yeah. Well, I, I do think that actually, you know, Mark Cuban actually tweeted that it's, it's been on the docket for a while and, uh, and, uh, you know, it's not a new thing that they've come up with and they do write about this stuff because it's, uh, um, they think it's going to help them with the left or something like that. They know that the, that can't get passed, and thank God it can't get passed because whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, there is right or wrong. I mean, the society now is flailing because we have left-leaning policies and we have right-leaning policies. We don't have right or wrong policies anymore. So if you're the SEC and you've got a kowtow to Elizabeth Warren, let's do stupid stuff at the SEC and lose case after case in the court system. Let's sue Coinbase, who's trying desperately to get everything right and to follow the rules. Let's sue them. You know, and they look like horses' asses when they do that. Flip side is, you know, you've got the Republicans. Uh, you know, I'm a Catholic, but I'm a pro choice person. If I choose life because I'm a Catholic, that's my choice. Can't impose that on other people. That's a First Amendment religious situation right there. And so, this notion that we're going to have a uh, handmaid's tale for women in the society and that Trump is in Time magazine saying that, yeah, well, we'll police and monitor women during their pregnancies. What the hell is he talking about? All right. So, so we've got nuts on both sides. And so I'm not about left or right. James this is probably why I get in so much trouble. I'm about right or wrong. I mean, you know the difference between right and wrong. It's well, not and that hard. It's not that complicated. I mean, I agree. And sometimes my listeners criticize me. I've never voted in my life because I don't want to be on a team. And I feel I'll be too, just the process of voting, I feel will influence me too much. I'd rather be able to express my opinion that's my own personal opinion and not be, dis you know, actions can often precede thoughts and feelings. And so I don't want to make the action of voting and then suddenly now, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or whatever. Like I want to have my own opinions on things instead of belonging to a team. And I think, look, you've, you've confronted this, you've joined teams and then they don't work out. Like sometimes some of these guys, they might have your beliefs or seem like they do, but then there's something different when you work for them or, or donate to them or, or they get elected and you donated and they're, now they're no longer who they were. I mean, you know, that's what really goes on, isn't it? I mean, I mean, I know people are going to be mad at me for saying this, but Trump was a moderate. He was pro-choice before he, he was pro- He was a Democrat he, in, in New York. He was a Democrat. You know that. He went to Elton John's wedding. He didn't care about transgenderism. He didn't act like a homophobe. You know, I mean, we can pretend that, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, we could, we could pretend that there's a, uh, you know, I mean, people yell at me. They say, oh, you knew Trump was an asshole. You lived in New York. Of course you knew he was an asshole. Oh, great. Yeah, he was an asshole, but he was our asshole. I thought he was going to 
do an okay job, actually. I thought at age 70, we had the opportunity to get a guy that wasn't really beholden to the lobbyists. And we had a guy that maybe he would be a post-partisan president. Maybe he would be transformative and help us. I didn't think he was going to turn into a nut, that the, the full-on nut job that he became. So I got that wrong, you know? So now this year, this election, it's like you can't vote for anybody. Who are you going to, who are you going to? Well, I'm voting for Biden. I mean, I, 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 look, there are choices on the table. There's dementia and there's demented. I'm going with dementia. Okay. If there's movies, we're going to go to the movies. There's Weekend at Bernie's where the guy is half dead and he's forgetful and he's elderly. Or there's one flew over the cuckoo's nest where the guy's full on crazy and needs a lobotomy. Okay. I'm going with the least harmful of those two. Okay. Mr. Trump has said that he wants to effectively revoke the democracy. He wants to expand executive powers. He wants to come after his adversaries using the Department of Justice. He has said that he wants to shut down or take away FCC licenses for people that disagree with him in the media. He wants to change the standards associated with the freedom of the press. Uh, He's saying all this. I'm not saying it. He's saying it. When he's asked if you want to be a dictator, he told the uh, Sean Addy he wants to be a dictator for a day. He told the Time Magazine guy that people like dictators. Okay, your family and my family have been benefiting from the flat decentralized structure of the United States and the knowledge, the wisdom that our founders had to make it so we could be protected from an autocracy. And this guy is a nut job. And we have no institutional memory of fascism in this country because FDR put down the first America first movement. So we don't, we don't go on field. You know, they go on field trips in Germany. Say, this is what the Nazis did. They go on field trips in France. And they say, okay, here's where the blitz happened in London. Okay, so the Europe has all of this hereditary and institutionalized memory of fascists and the plague of fascism. The United States, we don't. So weirdly, we think, okay, well, maybe that's a panacea. Maybe that's a, a cure-all for our ills. Okay, I'm not saying all of us, but there's a large enough group of us that think that. And Trump represents that. We can't have that. I'll, I'll, I'll go with Weekend at Bernie's over that. Well, you know, your book, From Wall Street to the White House and Back, there's also a lot of stuff that's, that's really important that you don't see in a lot of books written by Wall Street or political guys, which is, you know, how to find purpose in life, how to find meaning in life, and how connected that is to, to happiness. It's a very philosophical book based on all of these experiences. There's one piece of advice you, you give that, that's very important. And this I really encourage young people to read this. Do a little, and it's going to sound almost like a cliche when I say it, but do a little each day. If you write, for instance, five pages a day, then mm-hmm. in two months, mm-hmm. you're going to have a pretty big novel. You're going to have a Game of Thrones sized novel. So that's all that I don't want to say that's all it takes is for success. But like you say in the book, if you don't do anything, there's nothing for you to be happy or sad about. There's, there's just going to be nothing. So, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, I really encourage that this philosophical aspect. OK, we can talk all day about Bitcoin and failures and successes and and politics, but individually. We need these nuts and bolts first. We need these this to lay this foundation for success. And you, we didn't talk much about this, but that's what a lot of the book is about from your own experience. And I, I really appreciate you writing that in, in this book. Well, it's very sweet of you to say. You know, I, again, I try to make it real, and I tried to talk about it openly. Uh, it's one of the things I admire about you. Uh, you have a lot of self awareness in your writing. You have a lot of um, human observation, and so. Uh, with human beings, there comes levels of fallibility. And uh, whether it's you, James Altucher, Robert Greene, writing about the uh, the real uh, stuff, if you will, the uh, uh, the rights and wrongs. You know, like people try to pretend that they have no jealousy or envy. They do. People try to pretend that they're right or they don't have mean streaks in the personality. Well, guess what? They do because everybody does. And I'm trying to just make it as real as possible so that if a young person picks up this book and, and reads it, they're like, they have space there 
to make mistakes and they have space there to figure things out without being overly judged. Yeah, all very important stuff. So much more important than than the things we tend to argue about all day long on social media. This is like the real stuff. But Anthony Scaramucci, once again, it's been great. I mean, it's 14 years since we first met. It's been great having you you're on the, the podcast you're the again. You're the man. I remember having, I remember having breakfast with you at the uh, core club. Let's do that again. Yeah. Yeah, we should definitely do that again. I appreciate so. you inviting me on. You got a very popular podcast and it's an honor to be on with you. Th thank you. So from Wall Street to the White House and back by Anthony Scaramucci. Good luck on the book. Congratulations. And look, let's talk again soon. All right. Thanks, brother. That was great. Thank you. I really thanks, appreciate Anthony. it. You're you're great at this, by the way. I got to learn some stuff from you for my own podcast. You know, I, I don't know. So I, I, I always think about each episode after and like what I could have done differently, what I could have done better. I always get a little nervous before each episode. So it's, it's, it's hard. You know, now you're doing a podcast. It's like, hard. It's hard. I do. I do this podcast now with Caddy K and it's, uh, it's hard. Also, she's like a 25 year, you know, media veteran. I'm, I'm really not, you know, I'm like a good bullshitter, but I, and I, and I no, like, but you're, you're, you know, you're a natural, you, you really, that's why you're controversial is, the, you know, you want to get a lot of five-star reviews and one, and one-star reviews. The worst is the three-star reviews. Right, right. It's good. You don't that's get the three-star reviews I as a person. I definitely don't. It's definitely, you go one way or the other on me, you know, but yeah. I will say this, and I said this to somebody, if you've done business with me, if you worked at Skybridge, you generally like me. Okay. I've never fucked anybody in business. It's just the people, people that don't know me are the ones that really fucking hate my ass. You know what I mean? But yeah, whatever. no, that's to right. that's always the way it is. It's a, and it's the vocal minority too. Like you don't know really the, right. the people who love you. They're normal human beings. Right. They're so not they going to open their mouths, you know? Right. But I really appreciate both of you for having me on. Very grateful. Let's, let's, uh, let's get together, James. It's been too long. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll be in touch. Like